in the interest of time, I'm going to now have Chris Ferguson go. Uh, take it away, Chris. Okay. Sure. Thank you, Rob. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Chris Ferguson. I'm the uh, invention coach for the Rapid E. coli Detection Project, or what we now know as the REP Project. i um, going to tell you a little bit about what we've been doing and set you up for a couple other talks that are coming after mine later today. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So at the core of this project, um, the real motivation is this global water crisis that's going on. You know, we're all very familiar with the pandemic right now, but due to widespread lack of access to clean drinking water, um, it, these waterborne diseases actually end up killing more people per year than COVID has killed in the time that it's been running rampant. So just to put things into perspective a little bit, this is a very big problem that has been ongoing for a very long time. And does not have an easy solution. Um, part of the problem is that a lot of the water quality assessment methods are either too slow, too complicated, too expensive, and require you know, complex laboratory equipment, or in many cases, a combination of all three. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So the goal of our project is to help with this um, in any way that we can. Uh, in doing this, we've kind of picked up on a number of the, the current standards within the field, um, particularly by uh, organizations like WHO and the CDC that are trying to address this problem. Um, most of these uh, operations see E. coli as being the preferred indicator of water contamination, particularly through fecal contamination. E. coli is not itself necessarily the cause of the problem, but it can be an indicator of other more serious pathogens that are in the water that's being consumed. Um, and so there is a number of, a good amount of work that's gone into this before my engagement in the project um, that kind of defined five key criteria for a successful tool that could assess water quality needs. Um, this is that it's intuitive with visually compelling results, uh, has minimal language dependence. So again, removing that specialized expertise or knowledge to operate. Uh, it's quantifiable because a simple presence or absence test, while useful, doesn't really help with the long-term goal of figuring out if a, if a source is clean, how clean, and what needs to be done to purify it. Uh, it needs to be convenient and cost-effective because in many cases, these systems need to be deployed at scale, or they need to be accessible to low resource um, environments that, again, don't necessarily have access to some of the complex laboratory equipment that people use. Um, and finally, it needs to be feasible in the field. So, you know, these things need to be usable on site in a quick and timely manner. Um, and I should note that while detecting the contaminated water does not solve the problem to access to clean water, it's a critical first step that can help in circumventing some of the problems um, with consumption of dirty water and ultimately can lead to saving lives. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So for this project, you know, when I first came into it, there was a lot of background um, that I learned about. It was driven largely by some efforts uh, through Engineers Without Borders that had been using these uh, compact dry Petri films to monitor water in remote locations. Um, and this led to the development of a cool portable incubator solution. And you'll hear about our efforts to kind of evolve that uh, that have been ongoing. But we really wanted to take a holistic approach to answering this problem. So, you know, the portable incubator is one piece of that. There are a number of other technologies, um, both biological and engineering in, in concept, that could be used to solve this problem. And we're interested in, you know, however feasible pursuing all of those. But we wanted to take a holistic approach. And so in addition to the invention piece that you're seeing at the top here, we also really wanted to focus on community building and outreach as a way to um, you know, secure more funding, get more people that are interested in either contributing ideas, contributing their time and volunteering, um, or you know, helping test some of our products. Similarly, we also wanted to focus on partnerships uh, and recruitment through those partnerships. And so to that end, we've had some discussions with uh, Rice University about possible ways to prototype or pilot particular projects um, as a source for potential volunteers. Um, and we've also had some conversations with uh, international institutions like UNICEF, vetting some of the ideas that we have and what we're trying to do and having them weigh in on it. Um, so next slide, please, Rob. 
So really in pursuing this, it's been ambitious. It's been a fantastic year that I've, I've had the opportunity to work on this. And I've really been impressed by the amount of progress that our small team has been able to make. Um, as you'll hear from Halima, we've started working on Portable, portable Incubator 2.0, also known as Moonrat, um, the goal of which is to take that initial conception of can we create a way to incubate these things in the field um, more accessibly. Uh, we've also consulted with social media, with the social media specialist to start to advance that social media. Sorry, I think I'm getting a little feedback. Somebody uh, needs to mute their mic. I'm not sure who it is. Can we try to figure out who that is? Uh, who's unmuted? I assume it's not Rachel Wynn. Hey, listen, you're, you need to mute your mic. I'm going to mute people at random to try to figure this out. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Rachel. Okay, go go ahead, Chris, please. Okay, sorry about that, everyone. Um, we also, in an effort to kind of build a community around this effort, um, we launched a stay-at-home STEM project, affectionately labeled the Wet Poo Project. Um, the idea of which was to kind of take advantage of uh, the very unfortunate circumstance of everyone needing to be quarantined, the disruption to school systems, um, to try and get people engaged in this water quality assessment um, problem. And so we, we went through the process of creating these cool little kits that would allow, you know, parents and their young children to assess like local water sources and figure out uh, how much E. coli was in them. Um, we promoted it through a social media campaign. Uh, one of our public inventors, Jerry, uh, created this really great instructional video to help provide an overview of how to per participate in the project. We were really excited. Um, and while we did launch successfully, it unfortunately failed pretty miserably. Uh, no one ended up participating except for myself, um, but I think we, we learned a lot from it and we produced a lot of great resources that we look forward to using in future endeavors. Um, to that end, we're also producing a promotional video, Jerry's working on that now, um, that we can use again for the social media side of things to really get people engaged and interested in contributing to this problem. Um, and we've also been engaging in some more collaborations and discussions with experts, as I mentioned previously. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So oh, no, all of this is, of course, through this and then see. In, in, yeah. in thanks to uh, okay. everyone within public convention, the public volunteers that have really been helping with this project. Um, Shreya was one of the. She was here before I was, and she was really helpful in generating a lot of the initial social media content, doing some of the outreach. Uh, Rachel, who I'm sure you all know now, has also been very helpful in doing a lot of research and, and pushing forward the social media engagement. Jerry has been our lead videographer and incredibly helpful in his contributions to this project. Uh, Sam was one of the original creators of Moonrat, um, and then that has been handed off to Halima, who's done a great job of contributing. So, wonderful team. Thank you all so much. Uh, next slide, please, Rob. So finally, I'd just like to make a call to action. Um, we really are in need of volunteers. I think we have a lot of great ideas, fantastic directions that we can take this in, but what we really need are people to help us do that. Um, and so in that vein, we're looking for both people to join the Rapid E. coli project, as well as people to join the Moon Rat project. Um, and I think, you know, we've listed a number of different skill sets that would be useful here, but really what we want are people that are interested, they're passionate for this cause, and they're willing to learn. You know, we have, Rob and myself are more than willing to teach people as much as we can to help them address this really critical problem. Um, and we think it's a really exciting opportunity for anyone that wants to join. So next slide, please, Rob. No. So thank you all so much. And if you have any comments, questions, want to volunteer, know someone that should, please reach out to me. My email is there or connect with Rob and Rachel, uh, and they can connect you to me. So thank you all so much. Chris, this yeah. is Martin Smith. I We purchased uh, some of the, the slides um, at, I volunteer at a museum and we, we, invested enough money to buy a few of the the 3M slides. And mm -hmm. as I looked over the requirements, 
I, I w it wasn't clear to me that moon rat was still an important aspect of the project. So moon rat is definitely an important aspect of the project. I think, you know, we've kind of got a short term goal and a long term goal. Moon rat really helps take the process of infield use of those dried slides, which, you know, there, there are options for doing like body heat incubation of them, but it's not very reproducible. It's not very scientific. So the incubator allows you to remove those aspects of it, standardize it a good bit more and keeps it field ac applicable. It doesn't require the transport back to sites. Um, I don't want to steal too much thunder from Holima and the, uh, the mint incubator team, but that's the gist of why we think that's important. We do have our site set on longer term goals, which is why we're trying to do partnership and collaboration that would involve more advanced methods for detecting the quality of water, whether it was chemical detection, uh, chemiluminescent detection, some sort of fluorescence based method. Um, we really want to set our sights on those for the long term and set up the, the kind of collaborative engagements we need and talent pool to make that happen. Does that get your question, Martin? Yes, thank you. Okay, of course. So let's hear it for Chris Ferguson. Thank you very much.